Hey everyone, my name is Britt Guest. Um, I'm one of the co-authors on the Corpendium COVID-19 book chapter with Crystal Ives. And I know Mel just did a bunch of updates, but there's been so much more added to the book chapter and we haven't had a live show in a while. So I wanted to highlight a couple of the other things we've recently added to the chapter. Speaking of live shows, when we had our last live show, a bunch of people asked about home oxygen protocols. Now, you probably, some hospitals, a lot of hospitals already have this in place, but for those that don't, there, I think this is a reasonable protocol and a way to approach who's safe to go home with home O2. So candidates for home O2, basically you need somebody who's hypoxic, less than 90% on room air. Then you put them on some nasal cannula, no more than five liters. And if they can maintain their O2 sat above 90%, that's a good sign. Now, once you have them on that homo, or once you have them on the nasal cannula, less than five liters, you got to make sure that they can walk around and not desat. So you want to walk around and about 50 feet, they shouldn't go under 90%. And then you probably want to watch them for a little bit in the ER, maybe three to four hours, and make sure they're stable on that amount of oxygen and not requiring more, because then they probably need to stay in the hospital. Now, patient factors that you want to consider here. You probably want an age cutoff of about 65. They probably shouldn't be going home if they're 70 or 75 requiring oxygen. You want to make sure they don't have any chronic lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, things like that and that they have really close follow-up. So if something does get worse, they can reliably come back pretty quickly. And then you wanna make sure that they have a stable residence. This probably isn't, this isn't appropriate for somebody that's living in a shelter or homeless. They need to have electricity, they need to have an outlet so they can plug in that O2 concentrator. And then there's really no hard or fast rule on this, but we recommend just, you know, having caution in people with some pretty serious uh, chronic illnesses like end stage renal disease, liver cirrhosis, heart failure, pregnancy. All right. Now, convalescent plasma. There's been a ton of studies out about the efficacy and the safety of convalescent plasma. And what we're seeing more and more in the literature is that it probably just isn't as helpful as we would have hoped. So this comes from the recovery trial. This is, you know, of course, a big randomized controlled open label uh, platform. And for their convalescent group, they randomized over 5,000 patients to get convalescent plasma. And then they randomized another 5,000 patients that just got kind of usual standard of care. And what they saw when comparing these two groups is that the, they basically both had the same mortality rate. 24% of patients from each group died. So the 28-day mortality for both groups, really, there was no significant difference and convalescent plasma didn't really seem to be that helpful. Now, this is a KFF COVID-19 vaccine monitor, and I think it's pretty interesting. There's a link to this website in the um, book chapter. And basically, it's this ongoing research project that basically tracks the public's attitude towards the COVID-19 vaccine. And you can look at this over different racial and ethnic groups, different age groups. You can even look at different um, settings like an urban community versus people living in a more rural setting. And I think this can be helpful for physicians and uh, different providers just to know what community you know they're practicing in and kind of the trends and the attitude of their community towards the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, we're finally getting some information on safety and side effects now that the vaccine has been out in the community. And vSafe is this awesome kind of, it's a smartphone-based tool that the CDC is using to collect information on people's experience and side effects to the different COVID-19 vaccines. And so basically, you download this app on your smartphone, you put in the vaccine that you got, Pfizer, Moderna, now Johnson & Johnson, and you just track your symptoms and just report, you know, I got fever, I had malaise, I had myalgia whatever it might be. So what we're seeing, of course, the biggest side effect we get worried about is anaphylaxis. So between Pfizer and Moderna, this is through January 18th, there were five per million doses of anaphylaxis to Pfizer and 2.8 per million doses to Moderna. So yes, there are some cases of anaphylaxis. It's pretty rare, not very common, maybe slightly more uh, in the Pfizer, but very minimal nonetheless. Now, when comparing Pfizer and Moderna, the overall symptoms are pretty similar. So you're going to see headache, you're going to see fever, pain at the injection site. These really aren't all that surprising. 
Now, in my experience, just talking to my friends who have been, you know, either gotten Pfizer or Moderna, I hear that there's a little bit more, uh, it seems like there's a little bit more side effects with the Moderna. And I hear a lot of more people getting fever. And that was actually seen in these uh, reports that fever was a bit more common in the group that got um, the Moderna vaccine compared to Pfizer. Now, I think what's really interesting is that we're really starting to get some information on pregnancy in the vaccine, which is so important because, of course, in the original clinical trials, we weren't really looking at pregnant patients getting the vaccine. Now, some of the women became pregnant during the clinical trial, and we can extrapolate a little bit of information from that. But now we're finally really getting some solid information on women who were pregnant and vaccinated. So in this chart, you can see the background rates of, you know, pregnancy complications, things like, you know, uh, miscarriage, uh, preterm labor, eclampsia, all of those complications. The background rate is that first column. And then you see the V-safe pregnancy recorded rates to compare that to. And what you find is the women that got vaccinated, there are no increased reports in any of these pregnancy complications in any of them. Preterm labor, miscarriage, stillbirth, gestational diabetes, it's all pretty similar to our normal background rates that we see in the community. So again, we still need a lot more information on this before we can really determine and make statements about safety of this vaccine. But I think this is really helpful to finally get some information and moving forward, it appears that uh, we don't have increased pregnancy complications for those women who are pregnant and vaccinated.